Women of Science and Music, 30 Celebrations. Episode 3, Two Doctors, 100 Years. There's many a lass of the scientist clan that has followed her brief in the field. She has sworn, she has cursed, been ignored and abused, but a scientist never can yield. I am Frances M. Lynch, the Artistic Director of Electric Voice Theatre, and you are very welcome to our third podcast in the series Women of Science and Music, 30 Celebrations. If you heard our previous episodes, you'll remember this song. It was written by Mary Maxwell Campbell in the 19th century. Originally called the March of the Cameron Men, it's now been requisitioned to herald the advance of women in science, and today, particularly those in medicine. In this third episode, Two Doctors, One Hundred Years, Catherine Booth, the retired science curator from the National Library of Scotland, will be exploring the life of Dr Adeline Campbell as a figurehead for the many young women who served in medicine during and after the First World War, both on the front line and at home, where a terrible infectious disease was sweeping the UK, very much as COVID-19 is doing 100 years later. You will also hear the voice of critical care doctor Talia Monroe Somerville from St John's Hospital in Livingston and the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. She will be talking about her own experiences of working in the NHS today and her thoughts on the importance of remembering not to forget those who blazed a trail for women in medicine like Adeline Campbell 100 years ago. Their two voices are interwoven with this music, which I created using words from Adeline Campbell's contemporaries, beginning with a speech made by King George V of England during the First World War. have this wonderful academic adventure through medicine which is absolutely fascinating but there is also a very big element of your heart and there's very little judgment about whether you're a ne'er-do-well off the street compared to coming in as a baron off his estate you get the same treatment from the same people and, and the same level of care I'm tremendously proud of that A lot of them had this belief in making life better for less well-off people, something that must have been instilled in them all by their father, who was a very well-respected minister in Kirkcaldy. Adeline Campbell, doctor, born at Kirkcaldy Old Kirk to the minister and his wife in 1887. One of eight daughters, five of whom became doctors. Jesse Campbell, Lizzie Doctor, Campbell, Annie Campbell, an Doctor and, and Medical Officer in the Women's Campbell, Royal Air Force, Doctor Ishbel Campbell, Adeline Research Campbell, Research Chemist, known as Lena, served as a junior surgeon in Serbia during World War I with the Scottish Women's Hospitals under Dr Elsie Inglis. Thanks to her great courage, she received many honours from that country. She always stood up for what she believed was right. Risking typhus and the wrath of Dr Inglis, Lena and her colleague, Dr Catherine McPhail, insisted they were needed elsewhere in Serbia. So they left and set up a hospital for typhus patients in Belgrade. She spent the rest of her life caring for children's health and taking a stand for those less fortunate than herself. Taking a stand, 
Taking your stand. She was always standing up for what she believed. In later life, she worked a lot with women and children, unmarried mothers, people who were stigmatised. She has worked in very unfashionable areas of medicine. She was always standing up for people who were less well off in the community. She clearly found a niche that she believed in. Quietly getting on with the job, doing what she felt was right, standing up for what was right. I think she should be celebrated. And having a bit of character and spirit, I think, made her quite a special person. She's a laudable, amazing woman. She does represent hundreds of women who went out in all kinds of roles to work during the First World War. She was in the first contingent of women to go to Serbia under the aegis of Elsie Ingalls and the Scottish Women's Hospital. Such tremendous courage going from Fakorti to Serbia. I'm sure she didn't know what Serbia was when she left. She was 27. She was the second youngest in the group their hospital was a schoolhouse, which was very dirty. There were already patients there waiting to be treated when they arrived. And they had to just set, do and start. In the same contingent was uh, Sister Louisa Jordan, whose name was given to the new hospital that was erected in Glasgow to treat COVID patients. After about three months, she died of typhus. There was a huge epidemic of typhus in Serbia at the time, and something like 150,000 people died. Nowadays, when we're used to the figures of COVID people dying, that figure begins to mean something to us. The pandemic and the effects on people and patients, I think, has been gruelling and I think will haunt us for a long time, partly because we saw a lot of people die who were young. And I think we found that difficult, you know, how much of that was because of us, despite the fact that we were working to the best of our ability and knowledge. But also we were seeing lots of family members, you know, people, people from the same families getting sick. People don't realise for intensive care patients, if they survive intensive care, that is the very beginning of a very, very long and arduous road to recovery. I think the reality for us was really, was really hard in what we were seeing as patients. In Adeline's day, it would be the same. These soldiers would go back with the dreadful wounds and injuries that they then mm. would have to cope with with the rest for the rest of their lives, as mm. well as the mental trauma. And of course, back then there was no facility to talk about it. You certainly didn't talk about feelings or pain or nightmares or all of these things that we know are very, very common in people who have been very, very sick. We now thankfully do recognise that and try and promote that, but it's still a very tough time for the patients and also their families. While Lena saved lives on the front line, thousands of women at home made the munitions set to destroy those same lives. The weavers, the welders, the aeroplane makers, gluing fabric on wings, painting with poison. Everything they touched went yellow. The munition heads, working with ether, headaches, hysteria, You'd wash and wash, it didn't make no difference, it didn't come off. Nausea, headaches, skin turning yellow, down through the body, legs and toenails, even yellow. Who are these really women? Explosions, poisonings, deaths. Small bits of brass seemed a target for my eyes. Particles of acid land on your face and down your throat into your eyes and make you nearly mad. Munitionettes. Yes, and you certainly do get industrial injuries and critical care. There's so much health and safety now, they're thankfully fewer than they once were. Apparently, they wore an all-in-one white combination outfit. It must have been a bit like a jumpsuit with the legs tucked into high boots, a bit like riding boots, and an overall on the top. And their hair was covered with a tight-fitting cap, a bit like a bathing cap, I think. Around their necks and arms, they wore bandages soaked in camphor. They would smear the boots with camphor too. And typhus was carried by lice and fleas, so they sometimes smeared their bodies with a mixture of Vaseline and paraffin oil to keep off the lice. What they smelt like... (laughs) Sounds awful. (laughs) Uh, Tragically, many of the doctors and nurses did catch typhus. 
I think I've seen photographs where they might have worn a, a very meagre face mask. I think there was no treatment for flu. We would even struggle now with an airborne disease. The FFP3 stuff that we wear would keep us safe, but it's a huge technological advance from where they were during the Spanish flu. In 1918, she obviously decided she could do more for the war effort and she volunteered again and went out to France with the Queen Mary's Auxiliary Army Corps. So for that, she was awarded a British War Medal and Victory Medal. People that don't really ever get recognised, but without them, we can't do anything. The ladies up at the coffee bar who would just be nice to you, the porters who were working all the time to get us all the right supplies and to top up the masks and the, the aprons, all the things that we needed. For me, that clap was about all of those people. She was awarded the Medal of the Order of St. Sab and a Serbian War Medical Service medal. We should remember her because it was an extraordinary time for her to go to Serbia and to do what she believed in. And I think there are lots of parallels really still with medicine. I think she has helped pave the way for women. She never married. Certainly I was never made to feel that I was at the detriment for being a woman in medicine. It becomes harder when you have children. She would have had to give up her job if she'd married. So most of these women didn't. They just got on with it. Essentially she acted as the patient's advocate with tenacity and integrity. She worked with a social responsibility and I'm sure also gave a lot of kindness and compassion. She started the pathway of systems and healthcare and all of the things that we still build on and I would hope that we see a lot of those qualities still in the people who look after each of us in the medical system that we have now. Remember, re It's always been quite a poignant poem for me because I see families in the grips of often quite difficult grief and challenge and anticipating whether or not somebody will live or die. It's not unusual to hear it or for it to be referred to. It sits very poignantly with me because of the families that I look after. there's no record. She didn't write diaries. I've scoured newspapers to find little reports of things she did and talks she gave and people saying she'd been a very kind doctor. She really has created a legacy for standing up for what you believe in. I think she's extraordinary and, and should be celebrated and thanked and remembered. And be sad. Remember by Frances M. Lynch From the poem by Christina Rossetti All the sung voices today were mine and we are very grateful for the expert contributions from science researcher Catherine Booth and critical care doctor Talia Munro Somerville. And of course, many thanks to you for listening. This is the end of episode three, Two Doctors, 100 Years. Do join us again on June the 14th for episode four of Women of Science and Music, 30 Celebrations. We'll be returning to Essex with science historian Dr Patricia Farah and Essex-born composer Cheryl Francis Hood to find out more about Marconi's secret engineer. 
and the music Cheryl will be writing about her, incorporating the first concert broadcast worldwide, which was given by Dame Nellie Melba a hundred years ago at Marconi's New Street Works in Chelmsford.